Uh, so we're going to switch gears slightly and, and actually hear about storytelling uh, and its importance in finding meaning, purpose, uh, and identity. And so first up is Jonathan Adler. Uh, Jonathan is a professor of psychology at Olin College of Engineering. So they're not all just engineers there, apparently, Rick. Uh, his research uh, focuses on the dynamic interconnections between stories of our lives and our psychological well-being. He is especially interested in examining the productive ways people make sense of the challenging things that happen to them and how the personal meaning, uh, personal meaning facilitates changes in identity development and well-being. John, Jonathan also has a budding career in theater. Although I don't know if budding is really the right word, since I, I believe you've been in, involved since childhood. Uh, however, last year, uh, Jonathan co-authored and produced an off-Broadway play, and is spending more time working with drama as both an art form and a method for impacting mindset and identity development. Jonathan is also a licensed psychologist, a uh, visiting associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and is currently serving as the editor of, of the Personality and so uh, Social Psychology Review, the premier journal for theoretical articles in all areas of personality and social psychology. Jonathan? Thank you so much. Um, it is such a treat to be here. I've been at Olin for a long time, and so Rick would pop into my office every once in a while with, I've got an idea, what do you think about this? And to see those seeds flourish in this way is, is really exciting, and, and I'm really touched to be invited to be here. Um, someone knew what they were doing when they planned the arc of, of the program. Um, I think I'm gonna do this segue from life design to what I think of as sort of transformative development. I've been in Olin a long time. I've been teaching in our design thinking stream for 10 years or so. We have a lot of students who go on to doctoral work at Stanford, and back in 2017, um, one of them invited me to come give some talks there, and I said, okay, but I wanna go meet the life design people. Um, so I got to meet Bill, and I showed up, and they said, you know, we don't have passive observers here. Come facilitate the class with us. Um, so this is a really, I think, nice segue from the particular toolbox of life design to thinking more broadly about the science of human development and especially human development uh, in, in sort of traditional college-age students, though a lot of what I'm going to say applies beyond traditional college-age students. So we're talking about development in emerging adulthood, right? If we think about the, the broad lifespan, that's where many of our students are. Um, and so if you think about sort of Erickson's model of lifespan development, there are all these stages of the life, and at each stage there's sort of a key psychosocial task that we're working on, right? So toddlers are working on autonomy, and many of us in this room in midlife are working on generativity, trying to give back to the next generation. Well, if we think about what emerging adults are working on, it's identity. So I would like to suggest that in emerging adulthood, life transformative development is identity development. So I wanna bring you a little bit of the science of identity development and then talk a little bit about how we put the science to work. Um, so when we think about identity development from the science of personality psychology, we're talking about narrative identity. Now, this is the idea that, the, that our identity is the story that weaves together our various experiences in our lives. So I've sort of inserted this word, narrative, um, and I wanna, I wanna justify that. So I wanna talk a little bit about why narrative. I know we're moving into a, a storytelling focus for the next couple of talks, so I wanna justify that for you. And I'm gonna give you five arguments about why narrative is so important. Um, so first I'm going to start with the grand theory of evolution. Um, and the current thinking is that narrative is the tool that evolution has shaped for us as a species. So, uh, you know, Stephen Jay Gould, the, the eminent evolutionary biologist, defined humans as primates who tell stories. Um, Daniel Dennett, who's a, a philosopher who's written a lot about human evolution, um, he says, you know, beavers build dams and snails extrude shells and spiders spin webs and bower birds build bowers. He's very interested in bower birds. Um, and humans tell stories. This is the thing that we do. This is the tool that we use for navigating our social niche. And our social niche is much more complex than that of a snail or a spider. And it turns out that stories are an efficient and effective tool 
for navigating our social niche. If we go from the grand theoretical down to the very mundane and you just watch humans in their natural habitat, this is what they do all day. This is what we do. We tell stories. Um, there are these great studies where they ask people, you know, what's the most important thing that happened to you today? So not the grand high and low point of your life. What, what happened to you today? And have you told anyone about it? Well, it's something like 60, 70 percent of people have told someone else the story of the most important thing that happened to them that day by the end of the day. Um, this is just the thing that we do. So from the grand theoretical to the very mundane and pragmatic, stories make sense. Um, there are good reasons. It turns out that this is how our brain is wired. So if we think about um, the most basic psychological process we talk about is this, the translation of sensation into perception. So sensation is the wavelengths of light hitting your retina, and perception is then what your brain does with that information. Even at that most basic level, we're telling the stories. So I assume that you have no trouble reading these two lines of text, but if you look carefully, the B and the 13 are identical. So the exact same wavelengths of light hit your retina, but because they're couched in these little proto stories with a little beginning, middle, and end, we have no trouble giving them completely different meaning. Right? And here's another example, right? I, you can see the white triangle even though you know it's not actually there. Um, if you think about that metaphorically, this is what we're doing all the time with our lives. We're taking the data that hit our sensory organs and we are imbuing them with meaning. And yes, that meaning has a correspondence to the actual information out there in the world, but that is a constructive process that we are doing all the time. And so if we scale up from wavelengths of light hitting your retina to the messiness of our everyday lives, it's exactly the same process. It's a constructive process that we are doing all the time. Um, there are also strong ethical reasons. Um, you know, a lot of psychological science is very top-down, where the, you know, the brilliant researcher has the idea and then they go out and test it and see if it worked in the real world. Well, narrative approaches tend to be very bottom-up. They tend to treat people as the expert on their own experience and then try to work inductively to try to figure out what's going on. So research participants like participating in this, this research where you come in and say, tell me your story, and then we'll try to figure out what's going on. And the field has a strong ethical grounding in the idea that People know what's going on in their lives. We just need to listen rigorously to them. So certainly the, the ethical bent to this field is a big reason why I went into this field. Um, and then finally, if none of these are persuasive and you're the just show me the data kind of person, I can show you the data too. Um, this is a, now it's a 2016, so it's a little old, this review, but my colleagues and I pulled together every study that had ever looked at the relationship between narrative identity variables and the other kinds of variables that psychologists tend to look at when they're interested in predicting well-being, things like our demographics, our dispositional personality traits, over and over again, we find that the way people tell the story of their lives is a better predictor of their well-being than these other kinds of robust variables with decades of research. So again, the data just demonstrate the, that narrative matters when it comes to well-being. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that narrative identity matters. Let me talk a little bit about where this comes from. Um, I'm going to start with development, um, right? As it's interesting that as a species, we are born without words, let alone stories. So this is something that we have to develop over the course of our lives. And there are these key milestones in development, like language acquisition that tends to be, you know, around the end of the first year of life. Uh, the development of theory of mind, which is the idea that other people have different internal experiences than you do. That comes online age two, three-ish all the way up through adolescence. Um, and so this is a skill that we are taught by our parents and caregivers. Um, and there are interesting uh, ways in which that plays out. So I have a, a close colleague I work with at Emory University, uh, Robin Fivish, who studies the gendered ways in which we teach children to narrate their lives. And what she finds is that parents, mothers and fathers, tend to tell their little boys stories about what happened to them, and they tell their little girls stories about how they felt about what happened to them. And so by the time these kids are able to be narrators of their own life, they have learned very different stories about what counts, what are the things I'm supposed to attend to. 
So my husband and I have a young daughter and a young son, and thanks to Robin's work, we're really careful when we put them to bed. We say, you know, oh, we went to the zoo today. You were really scared of the tiger, but then it turned out okay. Right, so we're trying to give them the, the full narrative toolbox so that when they become narrators of their own lives, they have all kinds of narrative uh, tools available to them. Um, the field of narrative is grounded in the study of autobiographical memory, memory about the self, and this has been a, a puzzling phenomenon to cognitive scientists for decades because our memories are really bad. We're really not good at remembering exactly what happened to us. Um, and so if you want to know what really happened, don't ask someone to tell you a story about it. But why would this be? Why would we have this tool that's so bad? Well, in about a decade ago, the work started out quite speculative, and now there's a lot of empirical research supporting this idea that we don't have memory so that we can hold on to exactly what happened to us. If you think about our evolutionary past, you don't need to remember that, you know, that bear jumped out of that cave. You need to remember that dark places might be dangerous. And so if we could only remember exactly what happened to us, it actually wouldn't be that useful to us, right? The present and the future are never an exact replica of the past. So this slipperiness of memory is actually a feature of the system, not a bug in the system. So the, the research on narrative is very interested in the ways in which people reconstruct their experiences. Um, and then finally, we live in a rich narrative ecosystem, right? We are immersed in stories about us from before the time we are born. Um, and so we grow up in a culture of stories, and some of those stories have a lot of power over our lives, and we call those master narratives. There are master narratives about gender, about race, about STEM, about college, right? So, and we all live in many cultural contexts, so we're all swimming in a variety of narratives. Um, one master narrative that's received a lot of empirical tension is an American master narrative of redemption. Things that start bad, end good. Um, there's a wonderful book called The Redemptive Self, Stories Americans Live By, that traces the theme of redemption throughout American history, interweaving the study of cultural narratives with individual people's narratives. And we just find over and over that we're grappling with redemption. Americans love this story. And it's not a universal story. I have colleagues who work in Palestine, in Sweden, um, where re redemption is not the master narrative. Um, so rede master, redemption, like all master narratives, is not all good and it's not all bad, but it is. And so we're always, always grappling with these stories. We're always narrating ourselves in relation to the stories that exist in our cultural context. Okay. I want to, so I, I've tried to give you sort of an overview of the science of narrative identity. Now I want to talk a little bit about narrative identity development and its relationship with well-being. So the, the th research on narrative identity suggests that there are two primary um, functions of narrative identity. We, they support a sense of unity and purpose. So our narrative identity makes us feel like we are the same person across time and across situation and our narrative identity tells us why we're doing the things that we're doing. And so it turns out that when you feel like you are the same person across time and situation, and when you know what you're doing, that tends to feel good, right? So narrative identity ultimately supports our, our psychological well-being. Now, it, what's interesting is how we get there is actually not the content of our stories. Our, the content of our stories is actually remarkably unstable, which shouldn't be surprising given the slip of, of autobiographical memory. So if I ask you to tell me the high and low point of your life today, and then I ask you again in two years, you'll probably tell me a different story, even if it's not because a new high and low point happened. Um, but the themes that people use in telling their stories are actually remarkably stable. So uh, if, if people are interested, when we get to q and I can talk about some of the themes about which there's a, a robust empirical literature. Redemption is one of them. But what we're doing when we're trying to intervene with students' narrative identity is listen for the themes, less the content. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to give you just a smattering of research findings. I pulled stuff that I've worked on, figuring that I can answer those questions the best, but this is representative of a, of a much 
uh, this is a thriving, deep field at this point. So a lot of the work about narrative identity has been about making meaning of the past. So in a prototypical study like this one, and sorry, the asterisks indicate in undergraduate student co-authors. Um, in, a, in a prototypical study like this, um, we ask people to tell us the story of their lives and we find that differences in the thematic ways they construct their lives are associated with depression, low life satisfaction, low self-esteem, and that's true even controlling for uh, the impact of a lot of other variables that might explain those things, again, like our demographics, like our dispositional personality traits. But narratives do more than just help us make meaning of the past. They also serve as this foundation for future development. We're always filtering our new experiences through the stories that we tell about our lives. So in this study, we, we had a, access to a huge nationally representative sample. We had people's life stories, and then we had data about their mental and physical health every few months for several years. We pulled out a natural experiment. At time one, everyone was physically healthy. Between time one and time two, which was six months later, we pulled out a sample of people who received major physical illness diagnoses. So major cancers, diabetes, uh, you know, real life changing things. And because the sample was so big, we could pull out a match sample. So if we had a 56 year old African American woman with a college education who got breast cancer, we had a 56 year old African American woman with a college education who stayed healthy. Right, so sort of a natural experiment here. And what we found was that differences in the way they told their life story before they got sick were the best predictor of the trajectories of their mental health after they got sick. And that was true regardless of what happened with their physical health. So some people got sicker, some people got better, some people stayed the same. Whatever happened to their physical health the way they were making sense of their lives before this major event was the best predictor of what their mental health was like after the event. Um, I'm quite interested in, in the way we make sense of illness and physical health. I, I teach at Harvard Medical School in addition to it, Olin. Um, and so I had an opportunity to partner with some colleagues um, who are interested in um, biomarkers. I think this is the only study that's connected narratives and biomarkers. And here, again, we had a, a group of, we had two groups, a, one group of um, parents living under a chronic situation of chronic stress. These are parents with quite severe, with children who with quite severe autism spectrum disorder. Um, and then another group of matched parents who had neurotypical children, so not low stress, um, but sort of typical levels of stress. And we looked not only at the, their stories and um, their self-reports of their mental health, but we also looked at their telomeres. So telomeres are the end caps on our genes, and every time our genes divide, the telomeres degrade. So some people talk about telomeres as sort of a, bio, a biomarker of aging. Um, and under situations of chronic stress, it's well demonstrated that, that telomeres degrade faster. And so what we found again was that different ways of narrating this stressful experience, being the parent of a very challenging child, actually served as a buffer against telomere degradation. So parents who had certain kinds of themes in their stories um, had less telomere degradation over the following 18 months than parents who had different kinds of stories about their challenging experiences, again, controlling for a ton of other variables that might explain that away. And then the last study I wanted to talk about is one where we're interested in how the narratives change themselves. Um, these other studies I've mentioned, we had big, rich stories, but just at one time point. But of course, stories also evolve. So in this study, um, we got, these are, uh, were adults who contacted an outpatient psychotherapy clinic to say they wanted to see a therapist. Huge range of issues um, from, you know, Tr you know, trouble in relationships, basic challenges in daily life, up through real significant psychopathology, um, all different kinds of treatment that they received. Before they started treatment, we got their stories, and then in between every session of therapy, we got their stories and measured their mental health um, using standard questionnaire-based measures. Um, and then we were able to quantify the themes in their narratives and track the trajectory of their stories alongside the trajectories of their well-being. What we found was that 
people got better over the course of therapy, which is good because decades of psychotherapy research suggests that it works. Um, we did find that their stories changed over the course of treatment. And then using these lagged statistical modeling approaches, we actually found that their stories changed before their mental health changed and not vice versa. So we titled the, the paper Living Into the Story because it was as though people were sort of narrating a new version of their lives and then a week or two later their mental health would sort of catch up with that story. So this is again just a smattering, like a high level introduction to a rich and robust field of, of inquiry into the relationship between narrative identity and well-being. So I want to talk a little bit about putting this science to work. Um, as John mentioned, I have uh, an arts side to me, so I'm really interested in, in the way stories work in our lives, not just in the sort of scientific way of understanding them. So I, I put the science to work in a couple of different domains. I'm going to just focus on one of them. I work really closely with a nonprofit organization in Cambridge, Mass, called Health Story Collaborative, where we work with medical patients to help them tell the story of their experiences with illness and healing. Um, as John mentioned, I wrote this play that, much to my astonishment, um, was off-Broadway last summer, and it was grounded in narrative interviews that I did with people talking about their experiences. And then I co-founded and co-run the Story Lab at Olin which, with my colleague Jillian Epstein, um, where we do a lot of programming, and so given our, the CLTE focus, I'm going to focus mostly on this today. So one of the main things that we do are story slams. These are scaffolded experiences whereby we work with students to help them tell their story. Um, and these are not life stories, these are discrete moments that they pick out that are important to them and, and deeply informed by the science of narrative, we help them do this. So at Olin, we started this initially as a co-curricular activity and now it's a credit-bearing activity. It's also a, a sort of a signature event in our annual admissions process. We bring people to, to campus for Candidates Weekend and the students perform there. Um, we've also done this at a bunch of other colleges as clients. So we're working um, with Wellesley College right now on a story slam in their computer science department focused on elevating s stories of uh, underrepresented students who've had challenging experiences in computer science. Um, but so seed dropped. This is something I, we'd be happy, I'd be happy to talk with you about doing in your context. Um, all, we've also done story slams for scientific meetings. Um, the second president of Olin College, Gilda Barabino, is currently the president of AAAS. Um, and having seen some of our work, she said, you know, this is going to be my presidential initiative at AAAS. So two weeks ago, we were in DC with a really interesting hand-picked by Gilda slate of storytellers, from, including Gilda, who told a story herself. Um, these are people ranging from the, the woman in charge of science policy at the White House to someone who works in, a, in facilities at a local hospital, research hospital. Um, so really trying to elevate the stories of people who do, who do the science. Um, we've also done this for nonprofit organizations, uh, nonprofits focused on K-12 teachers, uh, nonprofits focused on summer bridge experiences for students who need some support with the transition to college, in academic medical centers focused both on medical students but also on patients and providers. Um, so we've taken this model and really refined it and brought it to a bunch of different contexts. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about how I've moved this into the curriculum, how we've moved this into the curriculum. So um, we do a course called Connecting with Stories, which takes not just sort of the individual benefits of storytelling, but also the community benefits of storytelling and really trying to leverage storytelling to, to foster community. Um, and then I work with a, a theater professor to do a class called Constructing and Performing the Self, which integrates the science of narrative identity with the theater of solo performance. The model is actually very similar to what we do in Story Slams, except that we have the entire theatrical toolbox available to us. So you're not just standing at a mic with your paper, you have set and lights and props and all of the embodied aspects of what it means to perform. So I have pitched this as transformative student development and I want to, to 
justify that a little bit. So I'm going to give you um, just a few pieces of evidence here. Um, my most favorite piece of evidence is that this course has led to one marriage to students who did not meet each other, who, didn't, who met each other in the course and who are now married. So that's, that's sort of the mic drop. Um, piece of evidence, but I'll give you other pieces. Um, the Association for Theater and Higher Education asks um, profession, theater professionals to have their um, productions professionally reviewed um, using a particular rubric. So we had a, we've had a reviewer come, and she, in her most recent um, review, she said, when a course such as this interdisciplinary course brings students together from diverse disciplines and provides them with a more porous approach to learning through immersive, experiential, team-based, and collaborative learning environments, it directly addresses the importance of developing 21st century professional skills and competencies critical thinking, oral and written communication, observation and pattern recognizing, kinesthetic intelligence, empathic awareness and reasoning, and creativity needed to meet professional goals. So this is sort of the instrumental take on this. This, is, this does things that are instrumentally valuable. Um, and I want to offer one more piece. We uh, asked someone who did not know us to come in and do sort of a formal mid-semester assessment of the course. And he writes, um, it's a challenging and intellectually rigorous course that engages its students in a variety of ways that require patience, commitment, trust, vulnerability, and accountability, and that pushes the students to apply the knowledge and insights gained in class to the deepest and most important of projects, the development of one's own identity. And then, of course, I need to bring in the student feedback because as someone who values the sort of bottom-up ethical approach, I'm going to let the students speak for themselves. So one student said, I ended up discovering a lot about myself, and as a result, I made a confident decision where to go next. In a way, I see this class as a means through which I figured out what I wanted to do with my life, and it just so happened to produce a side product that was my monologue. So again, a sort of clarifying, transformative experience. And then I'm going to give you one last quote um, from a student who has a not instrumental approach. So they write, and the next thing I knew, I wasn't strangers with these people anymore. Somewhere along the way, we became friends. I cared about how they were doing. I cared about the lives of people who just a couple months ago I had no idea existed. And by the time we started practicing in front of each other, we were an ensemble. And by the time the stage was built, we were a family. I didn't need to impress them anymore, in part because I knew I already had, but also, but even more so because impressiveness isn't all I wanted them to know about me. Impressing anyone is nice, but there's a kind of unconditionality to family that goes beyond the things you do in front of them. I didn't need to be impressive to feel valued or loved. I just was, am. And I valued and loved them all in return. It was the kind of love that let us say, hey, your expression is pretty blank here, try smiling. Or, I can tell you like it, but that line is not gonna read the way you think it will. Love is giving feedback, love is knowing when to pile on praise and when to leap into critique. Love is helping each other improve one 30 second chunk of text at a time. I've just got so many versions of me that I've hidden and explained away over the years, but bringing them to light and allowing them a voice granted me the kind of compassion for myself that I can't remember ever having before. Something tells me I'll be feeling the power of this piece for a really long time. So to me, that is life transformative education. And this is, this is just representative. When you bring students into an experience like this that has high stakes, right? They're gonna be performing in front of other people and they're gonna be doing it together. That is a recipe for, for transformative student development. So to wrap up, I just hope I've convinced you that stories really matter. They are the tool that our species uses for navigating our social niche. They're the building blocks of our identity. There's a robust, thriving science of narrative that demonstrates the way that our stories support our well-being. And shaping these stories is a powerful tool for nurturing a transformative process of student development. I would argue that when you engage with students, you are doing this, whether you're doing it intentionally or not. So why not marshal the science and be intentional about it? Okay, thanks.
Hi, thank you. So you mentioned that the themes are more important than the content, and then that the different types of themes that you saw dictated, like you know, health outcomes. What are some of those core themes that you're really teaching the students as they're learning how to tell their stories? Yeah. So it's interesting because we do this dance between doing it in a top-down way and a totally implicit way, and we do it differently in different contexts, right? In the constructing and performing the court, the self course, they have to write papers about these things. They have to go find these themes in other contexts. So they learn about them in a top-down way. In the story slam, it's all often implicit. So there are dozens of themes about which there's a strong empirical literature suggesting their connection. So I'll just give you a tiny taste. Um, so redemption is one, right? Stor things that start bad end good. The opposite of redemption is contamination. Stories start good and end bad. That is powerfully detrimental to people's mental health, so we're always on the lookout for contamination. Um, there are themes, a pair of themes we look at a lot are called agency and communion. So agency is something we've already talked a lot about just this morning, um, but this sense of how you portray the main character in your life story, i.e. you. So are you in the driver's seat of your life? Are you able to proactively respond to the things that happen to you? Or are you being batted around by the whims of external forces? And again, no one is actually entirely in charge of their lives. These are stories, and these are themes in stories, so they're movable. Communion, right, we are all, all stories are about characters in relationship to other characters, and the quality of those relationships makes a huge difference to our, our psychological well-being, and so how are people portraying them? Um, for the sake of time, I'll pause there, but I'm happy to, to refer you to stuff that will list, you know, the many, many themes that have have strong literature behind them.